Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Bruno Guicardi. I'm very excited here today. We have a very special guest for this edition of Straightforward. Uh, Steve Mills. Steve Mills and, and, and I will go way back. Uh, we've been working together for many, many years, and I'm here, here, here really excited to have him here today. Steve, you want to go kind of do a brief introduction of yourself, and then we will delve into our uh, conversation of uh, today. Sure, Bruno. Thanks for having me. Super excited to be here. It has been a while that uh, you and I have worked together uh, going back to, to my Google and Motorola mobility days. But um, I'm from a tech background, started out writing code back in the day when I came out of college. Hopefully none of that code still runs anywhere on the planet. Um, but from there, I got into project management and eventually uh, leadership and wound up as CIO um, at three different companies in a row. Yeah, and you've been you've been at, at very different companies, right? Still, like uh, you've been at Rackspace, which is like a, a digital native, a technology company by trade, right? Like, and then we move on to Motorola slash Google Mobility, right? And then to a media company, which was uh, more recently our Heart Media, right? So, in in, in all of them, you kind of uh, kind of a uh, I guess you undertake like a modernization, big. The modernization initiatives and that's what i kind of a i think would be really cool for our audience here to discuss like how to undertake those uh initiatives and both on the on the kind of the technical side but also on the process and and people kind of people slash culture uh change right so uh can, can you kind of give us a little bit of what 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 the what the what modernization was for rec space for example which is was already a tech company right but it was it was uh and I would say across the three companies that you mentioned, common themes really, it's the iron triangle, right? Like it's better, faster, and cheaper. And, and really, I would say I would say more collaborative, uh, faster, and more efficient were probably the big drivers. And I, I, I feel like if you do modernization just to modernize, you're kind of missing the point. And you mentioned business drivers. I think that's really important. Like you have to have good P&L reasons, good... Uh, company-specific business reasons if you really want to rally people around modernization. But at Rackspace, the really big themes were creating separation between our legacy backend and the new cloud products that were coming down the pipe. And you wouldn't think as an eight-year-old company um, that Rackspace could have made a very big IT mess, but I was pretty impressed. And there was a lot to clean up. And it was mostly small apps, a lot of them hand-rolled. We called it the hairball. And it really slowed progress as we tried to launch OpenStack projects. So that was sort of uh, the number one theme for modernization was to put an API layer in front of the back end and separate the products from the things that we needed to do that were uh, that were sort of boiler room uh, back office things. And that really allowed us to move much faster on the product side. Also allowed me to rip into some of the things on the back end and, and not be too disruptive uh, for the product teams. So if I understand, like, so, so like to decouple, like to kind of create a, a, an isolation abstraction level from, from the legacy, kind of a decouple it from the new things so the new things could adapt and adjust and, and unlock revenue of that. that. That was the plan, right? Absolutely right. And and uh, the, the terminology we put with it, the way we named that project was we called it the utility grid. And my metaphor for the product teams was it's like a power outlet on the wall where you can plug your hairdryer in and be pretty sure that it's going to work and it's not going to blow up in your hand and you don't really know what's on the other side of the wall. And that was the metaphor that we used and it, it stuck pretty well and IT embraced it because it kind of felt, you know, it was sort of a blue collar hard hat uh, sort of metaphor that that stuck with the IT team and uh, the product teams understood that. And so uh, in terms of having a, a business purpose to rally around, uh, that that really helped a lot. And, and it did help quite a bit because we had bogged down and getting open stack products out the door. And uh, it took about six months to to really separate things, or at least uh, 80% separate things. But once we did that, we released six open stack products in 90 days. Like it really helped us pick up the pace. And then the second big thing was to automate workflow for our global support teams and uh, support at Rackspace. I think at that time, there were probably 2,500 or so system administrators uh, for cloud and dedicated infrastructure that was hosted by Rackspace. And a lot of what they did was repetitive work and it had to be scheduled and done at different times. And so um, there was a big need for an automation capability that could be shared among those people in, a, in sort of a library style so that if somebody developed a really cool capability, they could 
check it into the library and others could use it and they could schedule it and that sort of thing. And that was also a great um, use case to rally around for cloud and agile because um, it was a, a highly distributed function. It was really bursty by nature because we did patching all at once and that sort of thing. So it could really take advantage of horizontal scale. And it was good a good learning environment for the IT team to wrap, ramp up on cloud and agile. And at that time, what we called DevOps automation that let us go faster. Yeah, that's amazing. Did, so so you, coupled, you coupled the technology change with uh, with processes changes as well, like uh, the introduction of agile, kind of a more integrated cross business business uh, uh, teams and product teams, I, I imagine, right? And, and also the uh, kind of DevOps uh, process uh, change as well, right? It's exactly right. And it was a great fit because Agile and CICD allowed us to iterate really fast, which was essential because the team that was building the system wasn't the same team that was uh, supporting our customers. And so we didn't know exactly what the system needed to be. And it was useful to be able to pull people in from the support teams, have them participate in our agile process and give us real-time guidance that showed up really quickly in the, in the form of shipped code. So we could operate on, on a two week sprint basis and, and affect changes pretty fast uh, in a way that was really responsive. And that, that sort of helped us to get the support teams bought in, but it was yeah. a big culture change as well for it, which, which had been sort of a waterfall, classic waterfall it shop up to that time. In, 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 in which sense, like uh, the, the culture change, like uh, well, what aspects of the culture need to change or ended up changing by the introduction of those just new, way, new, new ways of working? Well, collaboration is easy to say and hard to do, especially if you've never done it before. And I think um, waterfall teams are accustomed to collecting a bunch of requirements and going off in the corner for a while and building stuff and then bringing it back and launching it. And that's really different from having business leaders or, or frontline business people in this case, sort of up in your business and sitting with you and telling you that the, 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 that the thing you're doing in real time may not be the right thing. And it's a little bit uncomfortable, I think, at the beginning. It requires that you think differently and be more inclusive and more transparent. And also, people talk about failing fast and uh, it's okay to make mistakes. Uh, and again, easy to say, hard to do. But I think I think the collaborative agile life cycle encourages that because it's okay to do something and then di and discover that it was the wrong thing, especially if you find out soon and and if you haven't done a lot of work and if it's easy to reverse. And I think uh, agile is, is as a life cycle was really amenable to that. Yeah. And, and you, you touched on a point that it's, uh, it's very dear to my heart, like the, the how to change the culture there, the, the establish collaboration is, as I said, is easy to do. In our experience, it's like it, because it requires trust, like, you know, it requires it trust to collaborate. And it's hard to develop trust in teams that have been used to hand over and, and, you know, just hand over work for each other. And quite frankly, you know, hate each other's guts. I like that. <laughs> Even though everybody tends to mean well, right? Yes. Even though everybody's trying to do the right thing. But I think part of it is if you think about uh, old school projects where, you know, we used to, we used to take, 12, 18, 24 months to deliver something. Um, I try to imagine sitting here and building a 24-month roadmap <laughs> with any sort of fidelity in modern times. I mean, if you look back 12 months or 18 months or 24 months, who knew? Who knew what was going to happen over the last 24 months? And uh, it's it's kind of naive to think that you can that you can make decisions about deliverables two years away and have those deliverables still be relevant when you get done. Yeah, exactly. And, and to your point of fa failing fast, failing fast is great, but wh what we learn is like the only thing that actually creates trust is actually when a team ended up, you know, uh, sharing successes. Like when things go right, then then people celebrate success and create great bond and, and kind of creates resilience for the things that actually go wrong. But you don't create that trust that you need so much. By failing fast, that's, that's I think fantastic. I think that's right, and 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 I think you also can't understate the personal element because sitting together and working together and having frequent touch points builds a different relationship among people than uh, meeting every twenty four months to decide what you're going to do next, right? And yes. so I think that's another important element. Yeah. It creates it creates the environment to 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 be su successful, right? Just like I think so. Yeah, yeah. It, it it helps it helps your chances to actually be successful. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Cool. So, so 
So in how does the how the change that you kind of uh, took into uh, kind of rack space and all those areas how they differed to a challenge at Motorola Mobility, for example, which is kind of a still a tech company but not a softer, harder company. It's still like a where you know though that it, technology infrastructure was supporting a different business, right? So how that understanding of technology uh, is actually make it things more challenging, things or sort of make it easier, like uh, how that kind of make things different um, in, in terms of, uh, again, um, technology modernization for you? Well, Motorola was really different from Rackspace. Um, and the big challenge at Motorola was the shift from B2B, which had always been the Motorola business model, to consumer direct. And uh, that was around the time of the launch of the Moto X, which was a really cool phone. I don't know if you remember it, but it was the first time I think that consumers were told um, you can have any phone you want. You can define it yourself and we'll build it and we'll ship it to you within 72 hours. Uh, innovating with the supply chain as a competitive weapon, sort of like Dell did back in the day. But um, that was not at all what Motorola was. And it wasn't the systems we had built and it wasn't the way the processes worked. And the the, the paradigm shift was from a busy day uh, where where you might get three orders of several hundred thousand phones each to a busy day where a million individual consumers visit your website and place individual orders. And the tech stack required for that was wildly different. And not just that, but the change was profound. The, the cultural changes, the process changes, it was just a, a wildly different business model. Um, but the effect on technology was we had to build for high volume e-commerce and that was just not the system we had built. And so on the tech side, that meant stripping out layers and moving toward a more modern web architecture, and also uh, kind of along the lines of what we talked about before, reducing the dev cycle time so we could evolve and react. Because we didn't really know much about consumer e-commerce. We were sort of learning it as we went along, and we really had to be in a position to ship code often and to include product owners for the business teams in the development process because the tech team did not really know their way through this, and we had to figure it out together. So it was, uh, it was sort of, I mean, the problem set starts to sound kind of similar to Rackspace, and it is, if you squint your eyes, uh, even though the business model changes were wildly different. Yeah, in the experience of dealing, you know, if, uh, it's very difficult to, to, you know, in a B2B environment, usually you know your clients, you know, like you, you kind of have a, 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 much, a much closer relationship than, you know, and you have contracts established, right? It, when you go to a a D 2 C world, like where you don't have any any idea how your consumer, you, you not no amount of a, you know, a focus groups or user surveys will reduce the risk on on how people actually make purchasing decisions, right? So it's a only launching, right? So now our our experience in building digital experiences, building commerce, you may have great ideas, but your ideas are just as good as actually when you actually launch and see people if they gonna click buy or not right so and and it's it, and you have to have that ability to kind of a to shift things really fast so you can pivot and change you know your your strategies right otherwise you're not gonna succeed that's right and i think you don't really get to decide if your ideas are good ideas or not the market's gonna figure that out for you and then you're gonna live with the results of that but i also think in the b2b world at least that motorola had lived in uh, time scales were in weeks and months and years. And as you know, when you're in the uh, direct-to-consumer space, everything's measured in seconds. Like nobody's going to look at a screen in modern times for more than three or four seconds. And that mindset is really, really different from let's build a strong e-commerce or a strong uh, supply chain backend, which had sort of been the historical focus of Motorola. So it was huge. And, and the other thing that was an opportunity was to take advantage of Google Cloud as an insider. And that's how you and I met. Um, we were obviously looking for a partner that could help us scale up and and really help us to learn to do Agile. And I know a lot of the things we're talking about are, are part of the DNA of CIT. I remember visiting you guys in Campinas and actually watching, uh, watching sitting in daily scrums and watching you guys ship code multiple times per day. And we learned a ton from that. And it, it had a lot of positive impact on I would say the sense of urgency and the idea that things that IT could be a fast shop, that we could move fast and we could keep up with the business teams. Yeah, yeah, that that's the idea. But on the business 
and it's always a, 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 a difficult discussion, right? Because uh, IT teams tend to be, you know, just because of it and all the, the, the number of uh, friction that has between business and IT, they're, they kind of, a, they're, they're, they're a little hesitant to kind of a go to the business and, 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 you know, and say, we need to prioritize you. We, we need to reduce the number, the size of the idea, right? Because that, that's an important agreement that we, the IT teams, development teams have to, you know, establish with business teams because it, usually the ideas are very, you know, big, right? So let, we'll do this and this will be <laughs> gigantic. And how can we strip that idea to kind of a, to its really core so we can kind of a, you know, do this in a couple of weeks and see if it actually works because, you know, it's, you may think it is a great idea. Yeah. You know, those millions of consumers out there may think differently. So, and, and, and we better discover it, you know, the fastest and cheapest way possible because we, again, we went to, we went to kind of, if that doesn't work, we need to move on to the next one. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. That's right. So, and, and it's hard that that's probably like the, our, the hardest lesson we learned in this 28 years in this business, building digital experiences is actually most time, you know, more often than we, than we'd like to, uh, to acknowledge like the, our ideas, you know, are not the right ones. And we have to kind of adjust it, given and give it ourselves chance to, to, to adjust and only a process that acknowledge that in the first place, right? That's a. Like it, it, it's in a, unfortunate that we come from a culture where, you know, we think we're right, right? Like we we discuss our ideas in front of the board, and you know, it's very you know, <laughs> about pomp and circumstance, like and you know, very big ideas with big outcomes, right? But when when we're dealing and when those ideas depend on people experiencing, you know, that sales or that engagement on a digital environment. That's very risky. Just just see like a, how many products Google and Facebook have launched in the last ten years, and they killed it. And they, they are the ones that's supposed to have all the data in the internet and, and and know everything that even we don't know about ourselves. And still, they come up with products that fail. So yeah. that that shows you like how difficult it is to kind of uh, you know to come up with you know ideas that are different. Maybe when we're talking about innovation idea right so it's okay if you know if your com competitor is doing something you're just copycatting yeah that probably will, will go right but in, in this case of Motorola for example it's a big you know f you know phone company a device company kind of move going D to C it was kind of no one has done it before right? like super like how, how things are going to work in this environment it's very difficult to predict so we, we have to have ourselves that ability to adapt and adjust and I, guess I agree, and I and I applaud the Motorola culture because I think that's kind of what got us through. And and Motorola's been around a long time, and it's a very family-like environment. But I'll tell you this: uh, having lived through crises, because uh, you always have those, right? Um, it's a team that's really comfortable in their own skin, and uh, they know they're going to get through those things. And uh, the business teams and the tech teams tend to come together and um, work together and find their way through those moments. And uh, it was a really Fun place to work and a great experience to be at Motorola. It was it was fun 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 to work for us as well. Like a very a very talented team and as I said, like very resilient, very fun to work with. And what about the 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 last experience there, the iHeart Media? It's a completely different environment, right? Media. It's been you know a lot of technology influenced by you know maybe the first things that was kind of disrupted by by digital and still disrupted, right? So. How was the experience there trying to modernize, uh, you know, a, 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 a kind of radio company, right? Yeah, at its core. Uh, and and it, so it was a blast. It reconnected me in a way with my musical roots. I've always liked music, but uh, it got me really excited about it again because music is part of iHeart's, a big part of iHeart's DNA. But um, at the time I joined back in 2015, uh, um, iHeart had launched the new brand a few years before. Uh, previous it had been uh, previous to that it had been Clear Channel um, Media, which was radio and outdoor. But um, they had launched the iHeart Radio app and the iHeart Radio Music Festival, and streaming and digital uh, were clearly the things that were that were going to change um, the business. And there was a huge amount of technology change that was needed to make that happen. And one thing uh, that really became clear to me at iHeart, um, we talked about agile and. I think you can use agile principles in a big enterprise IT shop, but you're also uh, you're bound to be able to make commitments and to meet budgets and to 
allow the business teams to plan for things that are going to be available six or nine or 12 months out. And there's really no way around that. And so what worked for us at iHeart was to break things into pieces and to really think about um, a quarterly rhythm where we got together at the beginning of the quarter and we uh, had a big room planning session with all of our business partners and we did a retrospective on the previous quarter and we set goals for the current quarter and we put good business friendly names with them. And then we operated an agile process within those guardrails. And that worked pretty well for us. And it was something that we found our way to, I would say, over my first 18 to 24 months at iHeart. But um, the really big focus was automating manual tasks and applying artificial intelligence and cloud-based workflow to things that had been done uh, by humans the manual way for 30 or 40 years without a lot of change. And this implied on the business side, uh, standardizing and centralizing business processes. And then the benefit was better visibility, more control over things like pricing, and better access to data that had been really scattered across the business uh, before that. And there were three really big, uh, a bunch of smaller ones, but three really big business process focus areas. And the first and most important was sales um, and building out an integrated workflow with AI assistance so that we had a common process for getting radio proposals through the pipe. And historically, that had been done with uh, spreadsheets and hand-rolled apps and all kinds of stuff. And iHeart uh, is, is in 160 different cities across the U.S., and at that time, there were sort of 160 ways of doing everything. And we had just rolled out Salesforce, but um, it wasn't heavily adopted yet. Um, and so a lot of the challenge was the change management piece. And it was showing people that we could do things a better way and that we could take work away so that they could get back out on the street and sell, which is what they really wanted to do, and have less clicks and less administrative work to do. And that was, that was the, the way to guide people in that direction for sales. And then programming was another really big opportunity. There were thousands of people in the company um, in 2015 that, that were involved in the production of broadcast content and streaming content. Um, and the opportunity with technology was to begin to take away, again, a lot of that manual work and have software do things that software is better at than humans with an AI assist um, to make sure that we kept the local flavor of radio as, as we had software take over work for programmers. But much like the salespeople, the benefit for the programmers was a lot less manual stuff, and they got to spend more time doing what they really enjoy, which is discovering music and uh, and curating content and um, and working it as, a, as a discovery tool for their listeners and that sort of thing. That's and that's then finally it. broadcast. Uh, man, broadcast radio hadn't changed materially in 30 years before 2015, and uh, historically, you connected studios across town to transmitters with a T1 line. And uh, DJs produce content and it went out over the air and it was sort of gone forever unless you recorded it at the exit point. And so the, the big push uh, on that front was to begin to centralize the collection of that content and, and capture what was done in the studios, upload, upload it to the cloud where you could index it and then later on uh, download it to the transmitters for playout, which began to blur the boundaries a bit among broadcast and streaming and podcast because the real audio product the thing that iHeart's really good at is companionship and curated content. That's really what they're about. And that's a mixture of songs and ads and stuff people say all connected with metadata. And if you treat it that way, then it doesn't really matter in the end what you do with it. And terms like broadcast and streaming and podcast ideally become marketing terms and not technology terms, if that makes sense. It totally does. But th th those are kind of a massive uh, transformations right, that have that been uh, through uh, Steve, so it, it, it very you know scope very broad, right? Coming from like a, the from operational side, sales, you know the way the 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 even marketing, right? So like the all areas of the business, um, massive multi year transformation. Like it, uh, where where we've the experience going through you know different industries and doing this many times. Where, where do you uh, recommend people to start, right? That's where we, we kind of a, we have many clients and this is kind of a, usually where people struggle. Like, this is so big, right? Like uh, where, 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 where do I start tackling this challenge, right? So do you have any ideas or, or, or experience that you would like to share? Well, at iHeart, um, I mean, we started several things at once, but I would say the biggest early win was probably automation of something called traffic that I had never heard of until I joined iHeart. But traffic is um, placement of ads. 
in broadcast radio. And at the time I joined, there was a large group of humans that was doing optimal, and I'll use air quotes for that, right? Optimal ad placement. Um, air quotes because humans are actually not very good at that. If you hand a human 10,000 things and say, put these in optimal order, like, you know, that they probably won't get very far on that task. Um, but the thing about traffic was it was kind of non-controversial. Like it was a thing that had to be done, but nobody was really happy with how it was getting done because it was highly manual and everybody thought it could be done better and faster and cheaper. And it wasn't even a very fun job because it was uh, it was administrivia and it was a thing that software was provably better at. And there was already some work that had been done uh, before I came on applying AI to that task. And I say AI, it was really just basic statistics. It was really, you know, if you could write down the business rules, then you can have software enforce those rules. And uh, what you get out of that is the ability to centralize policy, which is great, and maybe optimize even the value of inventory and get data back on how are things going in the traffic world. So it was a, it was easy to get all, all of my business partners aligned around doing something about that. And it was an area that I knew we could make fast progress. And indeed, we set about a 12-month timeline with a really aggressive savings target and got it done. We hit all those numbers, which was great because it was a good, it was a win for the company. It was a win for the people that use that business process, but it also built a lot of credibility with our business partners that we could all sit together and put together a plan and deliver against it. And it was one of the first things that we did that was really agile where um, our business partners came and sat with us day to day and helped us prioritize and decide what to do next. And it was it really effective and it, it sort of set the foundation for sales automation and then uh, programming and, and eventually uh, for broadcast play out as well. Yeah, to, to my to my previous point, you know, fail fast is important, but yeah. fail, doesn't, fail doesn't create the credibility, not, neither the trust to actually, you know, build up and and and, uh, and, and do stuff. <laughs> you know, you know, I'll tell you what though, um, we had we had a virtual war room for a lot of that project because things were moving so fast, and we built a lot of credibility with the traffic team itself. And I remember watching that team sort of get over the hump of this is a thing that is getting done to us and begin to embrace it as, wow, this makes us more effective. Like, you know, we have more visibility, the things we're working on are more important than things we're working on before. And that was all great. But I also think to your point of, of and fail is sort of a harsh word, right? But for making mistakes or doing, doing things that weren't exactly the right thing and discovering it, I think being in a war room environment and, and, and watching the development teams respond where, the business folks would find a thing that we needed to fix and within three or four days we would fix it and we would ship it and they could see um the 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 the, the intentions of the IT team and the fact that people were trying to do the right thing and were willing to work quickly and and that we could move fast and that we could cycle quickly and we could make things better and i think that built a lot of goodwill um on the business side yeah that's a good point right? like just just if you're it it, it is excusable if you're not effective like if you're not picking the right things to do right like uh but but it's it's very difficult to be excused if you're not you know uh if you're not shipping things right like if you're yeah yeah and and it's easy to make all kinds of assumptions about people when you can't see what they're doing right but when it's all out on the table and we're all working together, then uh, I think it's clear that everybody's intentions are good and they're trying to do the right thing. Yeah, that, that's one aspect of the the agile process that is absolutely uh, incredible there, right? which is the, the the full visibility, right? So we're not there. There's absolutely nothing being you know hidden hidden from you know the business people, the product owners. Like it, it's all like a it's all, all open kimono, right? Like it's it's, yeah. it's all yeah. here. We're, we're and also, it's it's, it's an, one element that actually helps a difficult conversation with uh, with with uh, the business leader, which is prioritization. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that, right. that you know, distance kind of creates the illusion that you know, like, uh, hey, you just have you know, just do it, right? That we have all these things to do. Just figure out a way to do it, and then and uh, just scale the team to you know infinite capacity but there's the it, there's not no such a thing as infinite capacity or resources right so and when you provide the visibility that becomes very clear right people that are actually working their ship and they're cranking out the machine but also that resources are finite and we need to prioritize what actually going to ship right that's, that's right amazing fit there yep oh 
Steve, Steve, any final thoughts? Like, what, anything that we would we'll do different, or like uh, the kind of a like life lessons learned, like uh, the the through those that that journey that you kind of uh, you recommend people to kind of their starting their journeys or start kind of thinking about transformation or anything like that. It's kind of a that must have like a, in mind to kind of a, to to start doing it. So we we already learned like a, you know start with something that a that is promising that can you know can yield fruits and you can kind of build on that uh, for 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 the long haul right any other big thoughts there that kind of people should should pay attention to yeah i think uh you need you need c level executives and their direct reports that that own what you're doing and understand what it's about and and the burden is on uh me as the cio and and my team to make things understandable in business terms and to make sure that there's a good reason uh, that doesn't involve any any technical jargon for explaining the things that we're going to do. Um, that's 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 a great one, Radhika. Right? And I, I always advise like uh, other CEOs and business people that uh, they need to make an effort to kind of cross the bridge from the other side as well. Because if you think of like... Uh, CEOs and business people, right? They 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 learn so many disciplines, right? So they need to know the basics of marketing, of accounting, of legalese, right? So it then but with technology, there's always been a, a couple of you know a bit of a resistance. Like right? hey, I don't want to speak that language because that language changes so fast that is it, and it requires it demands so much of my time that I kind of I I I kind of a Turn my back to it, right? So, and that creates a, a very dangerous thing because it, it, I, I, I really commend you, like in your effort to kind of hey, let's get rid of the jargonese, right, and, and kind of speak business language. But I feel like, uh, and it, I think that's absolutely necessary. But I think for business leaders out there, they have to make a little bit of effort, kind of hey, they have to understand a little bit of that discipline as well, so they have also intelligent discussions with the their. Uh, Technical uh, executives and so on. So it's, uh, I think it's, I, I it's, think so. I think so. And and but it, I think it's human nature too to to embrace what you're good at, right? To and um, most of the folks on the tech team are there because they're technologists and that's what they know, and so that's their native language. And it's it's hard to it's hard sometimes to flip that around and think in business terms. But I think you have to do that, and I think you also have to let the end users of the things you're building help you define priorities in the form of the solution. And one of the things that became a best practice at iHeart, and we didn't always do it, but we, but, but we made an effort to, um, I established a process engineering team that was a bunch of Six Sigma Wag Belts. And when we were going to do something new, we would start with those folks. And they would go and sit with the business teams and they would do value stream mapping. And they would, they would write down the as-is business process and show it back to the people that were executing it. And uh, sometimes we would really freak them out because the way they thought things were going a lot of times wasn't the way they were going and no individual could see the whole process. And so simply writing it down was a good first step. And then the next step was how do we want it to work? And can we look just through that business process flow lens of, you know, if this is inefficient, then what does efficient look like? And then the other thing uh, we would have our UI UX team do is, is generate um, UI wireframes. Low fidelity, like we even had a tool that make them look to make them look hand drawn, right? But, but to be able to show people would something like this help, right? You can really get them energized because then they can begin to imagine a different world where they have less low value work to do and they can really focus on what's important to them. And I think those front end things really help to engage the business teams and also they're going to live with the results. And so it's good for them to have skin in the game and and to to be working alongside us and uh, and not feel like we're doing something to them. And that's that's uh, that's really great advice, Steve. I think uh, you you shared so much with us today here, like so so many valuable lessons and strategies, you know, to do with this massive challenge with it, you know, modernization, transformation, you know, the, all major transformations in the business today are kind of uh, propelled by technology and you know have technology at their at at, at, at their back there right? so it's, it's such a valuable lessons and i really appreciate your time and your willingness to kind of share that those 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 lessons with us today appreciate it thank you so much it's my pleasure